There was a seat all around the stove so that one could sit down and study the pictures. This at once took Heidi's fancy. As soon as she came into the room with her grandfather, she ran to the stove, sat down on the bench, and began to look at the pictures. But as she moved along on the seat and came behind the stove, something new occupied her whole attention. In the quite large space between the stove and the wall, four boards were placed like a bin for apples. <laughs> but there were no apples in it. There actually lay Heidi's bed exactly as it had been upon the arm. A thick bed of hay, with a linen sheet and the bag for a coverlet. Heidi shouted, Oh, Grandfather, here's my bedroom. Oh, how lovely. But where will you sleep? Your bedroom must be near the stove so that you won't freeze, said the grandfather. You may see mine, too. Heidi skipped across the big room after her grandfather, who opened a door on the other side, and this led into a little room where he had arranged his bed. Then came another door. Heidi quickly opened it and stood still in amazement, for it looked uh, into a sort of kitchen more enormous than any she had ever seen in her life. It had given her grandfather a great deal of work, and there was still much to do, for in the walls on all sides there were holes and wide cracks where the wind blew in, although so many had been nailed up with boards that it looked as if little cupboards had been made all around the wall. The grandfather had also succeeded in repairing the big ancient door with wires and nails so that it could be shut, and this was a good thing, for it opened into the most ruined part of the building, overgrown with thick briars where many lizards and beetles had their abode. The new dwelling place pleased Heidi well, and on the very next day when Peter came to see how they were getting along there, she had spied out every nook and corner so thoroughly that she was quite at home and could take Peter everywhere. She gave him no rest until he had thoroughly seen all the wonderful things which their new house contained. Heidi slept exceptionally well in the nook behind the great stove, but in the morning she thought she had awakened on the mountain and that she must open the door of the hut at once to see if, if the reason the fir trees were not roaring was because the deep heavy snow was lying on them and bending down their branches. So at first every morning she had to look around her for a while until she remembered where she was, and every time when she sat and she saw that she was not at home on the mountain she felt something stifling and pressing her heart. But when she heard her grandfather talking outside with Swindley and Barely and the goats bleating so loud and merrily as if they were calling to her, Hurry and come out, Heidi! Then she felt that she was at home after all, and jumped gaily out of bed and hurried to the big goat barn. On the fourth day, Heidi said, Today I must really go up to see the grandmother. She can't be alone so long. But her grandfather did not agree to this. Not today, and not tomorrow either, he said. The arm is six feet deep with snow, and it keeps on snowing. Stout Peter can hardly get through it. A little thing like you, Heidi, would be snowed in and covered up the first thing, and you never could be found again. Wait a little, until it freezes. Then you can easily walk over the crust. At first it was a grief to Heidi to need to wait, but now the days were so full of work that one passed away and another came before she knew it. Every morning and every afternoon now Heidi went to school and was quick in learning all her lessons. She hardly ever saw Peter in school, for he seldom came. The teacher was a meek man, and only occasionally said, It seems to me Peter is absent again. School would do him good, but there's a great deal of snow up there. Perhaps he can't get through. But toward evening, when school was out, Peter usually got through and paid a visit to Heidi. After a few days the sun came out again and threw its rays over the white earth, but it went down behind the mountains again very early, as if it were not so well pleased to look down as in summer, when everything was green and in bloom. In the evening the moon rose very bright and big, and all night long shone over the vast snow fields, and the next morning the whole mountain from top to bottom glistened like a crystal ball. When Peter jumped out the window into the deep snow that morning, as he had done the day before, something happened which he had not expected. Instead of coming down into the soft snow, he struck a surprisingly hard surface, and before he knew it, he had slipped a good piece down the mountain like an empty sled. <laughs> in great surprise, he finally succeeded in getting on his feet again, and then stamped with all his might on the crust to assure himself that what had just happened was really possible. 
It was actually so. As he stamped and beat with his heels, he could scarcely break off the least bit of ice. The whole arm was frozen hard as a rock. Peter liked this, for he knew that this state of things was necessary for Heidi to be able to come up there again. He promptly turned back, swallowed the milk which his mother had put on the table, tucked his piece of bread in his pocket, and said hastily, "'I must go to school.' "'Yes, do. Do go and study hard,' said his mother. Peter crawled through the window, for now they were shut again on account of the heaps of ice before the door, had pulled his little sled after him, sat down on it, and shot down the mountain. It went like lightning, and when he came near to Deerfly, where it goes farther down toward Mayenfeld, Peter kept on, for it occurred to him that he might injure himself and his sled if he should stop suddenly. So he went on, until he was down on level ground, and the sled stopped by itself. Then he got up, looked around. The force of the descent had carried him somewhat beyond Mayenfeld. Then he considered that uh, he should be too late for school, as it had begun some time before, and it would take him almost an hour to climb back there again, so he had plenty of time to go back to Deerfly. This he did, and arrived just as Heidi had returned from school and was sitting down to dinner with her grandfather. Peter went in, and as this time he had a definite idea to express, it was uppermost in his mind, and he had to say it at once. "'We've got it,' said Peter, standing still in the middle of the room. "'Got what, General?' "'That sounds rather warlike,' said the uncle. "'The crust,' replied Peter. "'Oh, oh, now I can go up to see the grandmother,' shouted Heidi joyfully, for she had at once understood Peter's manner of expressing himself. "'But why didn't you come to school, then? "'You could slide down well enough,' she suddenly added in reproach. But it occurred to Heidi that it was not right to remain away from school if one could uh, go as well as not. "'Went too far on my sled. Was too late,' replied Peter. "'That's called running away,' said the uncle. "'And people who do that are taken by the ears, do you hear?' Peter pulled his cap in alarm, for there was no one in the world for whom he had so great respect as for the um uncle. "'And besides, a leader such as you ought to be doubly ashamed of running away so,' continued the uncle. What would you think if your goats would run one this way and another that and refuse to follow you and do what was good for them? What would you do to them? Beat em, said Peter knowingly. Ah, and if a boy behaves like an unruly goat and is beaten a little, what would you say to that? Served him right, was the answer. Well, now understand, goat colonel. If you go past the school on your sled a single time when you ought to be in, in it, come here to me and get what you deserve. Then Peter understood that the arm uncle meant it, that he considered any boy who played truant as a, an unruly goat. He was quite impressed by this likeness and looked a little anxiously into the corner to see whether he could discover what the uncle used at such times for the goats. The uncle then said cheerfully, Come to the table now and sit down with us, and then Heidi may go with you. If you bring her back home at evening, you will find your supper here. This unexpected turn of affairs was highly delightful to Peter. His face was twisted in every way with delight. He obeyed instantly and sat down beside Heidi. But the child had already had enough and could swallow no more. She was so delighted that she could go to see the grandmother. She pushed the big potato and the toasted cheese still left on her plate toward Peter, who had already had his plate filled from the other side by the uncle, so he had a regular wall before him, but courage to attack it was not lacking. Heidi ran to the cupboard and brought out a little cape Clara had given her. Now she could take the journey, warmly wrapped up with the hood over her head. She placed herself beside Peter, and as soon as he had shoved his last mouthful, she said, Now come. Then they started along. Heidi had a great deal to tell Peter about Schreinle and Barely that neither of them would eat anything the first day in their new barn, and that they had hung their heads the whole day and not made a sound. She'd asked her grandfather why they did so, and he said they felt just as she did in Frankfurt, for they had never been down from the arm in all their lives. And Heidi added, You just ought to know once what it is, Peter. The two had almost reached the end of their journey before Peter said a word, and it seemed as if he were so deep in thought that he could not hear right as usual. When they reached the arm, Peter stood still and said, somewhat crossly, "'There! I would rather go to school than take from the uncle what he said.' 
Heidi was of the same opinion and encouraged him eagerly in his decision. In the room inside, Peter's mother was sitting alone with her mending. She said the grandmother had to spend the day in bed, as it was too cold for her, and besides, she was not quite well. This was something new to Heidi. The grandmother always before had been sitting in her place in the corner. Heidi ran straight to her in her room. She was lying entirely wrapped up in a gray shawl, in a narrow bed with thin covering. "'God be praised and thanked!' said the grandmother, as soon as she heard Heidi running in. All the autumn long she had had a secret worry in her heart, and it still followed her, especially if Heidi did not come to see her for a long time. Peter had reported how a strange gentleman from Frankfurt had been there and always went up to the pasture with them and talked with Heidi, and the grandmother believed nothing else than that the gentleman had come to take Heidi away again. After he finally went off alone, her anxiety returned lest some person should be sent from Frankfurt to take the child back. Heidi ran to her bedside and asked anxiously, "'Are you very ill, grandmother?' "'No, no, child,' said the old dame to console her, while she stroked the child's face affectionately. "'The cold weather has got into my limbs a little. Will you be, uh, will you be well right away as soon as it is warm again?' said Heidi eagerly. "'Yes, yes, God willing, even before that, so that I can uh, get to my spinning wheel. I even thought today that I would try it. Tomorrow it will surely be going again,' said the grandmother, for she had already noticed that the child was alarmed. Her words soothed Heidi, who was very much troubled, for she had never found the grandmother sick in bed before. She looked at her a little while in surprise, and then said, "'In Frankfurt they put on a shawl to go outdoors in. Did you think you ought to put it on when you go to bed, grandmother?' "'Do you know, Heidi?' she replied. "'I wrapped the shawl around me so in bed in order not to freeze. I'm so glad to have it for the bed covering is rather thin. But, Grandmother, Heidi began again, your head goes downhill, uh, where it ought to go up. A bed ought not be like that. I know it, child, I realize it well enough, said the Grandmother, trying to find a better place for the pillow uh, that lay uh, like a thin board under her head. You see, the pillow was never thick, and now I've slept so many years on it that I've made it rather flat. Oh, if only I had asked Clara, when I was in Frankfurt, to let me take my bed home with me, exclaimed Heidi. It had three big, thick pillows, one on top of another, so that I couldn't sleep, and always slipped down where it was flat, and then I had to move up again because I oughtn't to sleep so. Could you sleep so, Grandmother? Yes, indeed. It would make me warm, and I would could breathe so easily if I could lie with my head high, said the Grandmother, lifting her head rather wearily, as if to find a higher place for it. But we won't talk about that, for I have to thank the dear Lord for so much that other sick old people do not have, the nice rolls that I have all the time, the nice warm shawl here, and you're coming to see me, Heidi. Will you read something to me again today, Heidi? Heidi ran out and brought back the old hymn book. Then she found one beautiful hymn after another, for she knew them well now, and enjoyed them herself, and it was many days since she had heard all the verses she was so fond of. The grandmother lay with folded hands, and on her face, which at first had looked so troubled, now rested a happy smile, as if a great good fortune had come to her. Suddenly Heidi stopped. "'Grandmother, are you well again already?' "'I feel much better, Heidi. "'What you have read to me has done me good. Finish it, will you?' The child read the hymn to the end, and when she came to the last words, when mine eyes grow dimmer, sadder, pour thy light into my heart, that I might pass over gladder than men to their homes depart. The grandmother repeated them over and over, and an expression of very joyful trust came over her face. Heidi felt very happy to see it. All the sunny day of her journey home rose before her, and she exclaimed with delight, Grandmother! I know very well how it feels to be traveling home. The grandmother did not answer, but she had heard the words perfectly, and the expression which had pleased Heidi remained on her face. After a while, the child said, It is growing dark now, grandmother. I must go back, but I am so glad that you are happy again. The grandmother took the child's hand in hers and held it fast, then she said, Yes, I am so happy again. If I must stay lying here, I am content. You see, nobody 
who has not been through it knows what it is to have to lie for days and days all alone, and not hear a word from another human being, not to be able to see, not even to see a single sunbeam. And then she said, such gloomy thoughts come to me that it often seems as if it could never be bright again, and no one could bear it any longer. But when I hear the words which you have read to me, it is as if a light arose in my heart, and that makes me happy again. Then the grandmother let go of Heidi's hand, and after she had said good night, Heidi ran back into the other room and hurriedly drew Peter out, for it had already grown late. However, outside the moon was in the sky and shone as brightly as on the white snow as if the daylight had come back. Peter arranged his sled that sat down on it in front and with Heidi behind, and away they shot down the arm exactly as if they were two birds rushing through the air. Later, when Heidi was lying in her deep, lovely bed of hay, she began to think about the grandmother again, and how uncomfortably her head lay. And then she remembered all that she had said, and the light the words kindled in her heart. And she thought if the grandmother only could hear the words every day, then she would feel well all the time. But she knew that now a whole week, or perhaps even two, must pass before she could go up to her again. This seemed so sad to Heidi that she kept thinking harder and harder. What could she do to have the grandmother hear the words every day? Suddenly help came to her, and she was so glad about it that it seemed to her she could hardly wait for the morning to come so that she might carry out her plan. All at once Heidi sat straight up in bed, for she had been so deep in thought that she had not sent up her evening prayer to the dear Lord and she would never forget that again. When she had prayed straight from her heart for herself and her grandfather and the grandmother, she fell back at once into her soft hay and slept very soundly and peacefully until the bright morning. Well, after this, Peter came down to school at exactly the right time. He brought his dinner with him in his bag, for this was the custom there. When all the children in Dorfley had gone home at noon, the other scholars who had lived at a distance sat on the long desks, braced their feet firmly against the seats, and spread in their laps the luncheon they had brought for their midday meal. They could enjoy themselves until one o'clock when school began again. When Peter had spent the day in school, he went after it was over to the uncles to pay a visit to Heidi. When he entered the big room, Heidi ran to meet him, for she had been expecting him. Peter! I know something, she called to him. Say it. You must learn to read, was the news she had for him. It's no use. Oh, Peter, I don't agree with you, said Heidi eagerly. I think you can after a little while. Cannot, remarked Peter. Nobody believes such a thing as that, and I don't either, said Heidi very decidedly. The grandmamma in Frankfurt knew it that it wasn't true, and she told me that I ought not to believe it either. Peter was astonished at this news. "'I will teach you to read. I know how very well,' Heidi continued. "'You must learn now once for all, and then you must read one or two hymns every day to your grandmother.' "'Don't want to,' grumbled Peter. This stubborn objection to something which was good and right, and which Heidi had set her heart on, made her angry. With flashing eyes she placed herself in front of the boy and said threateningly, "'Then I will tell you what will happen.' If you will never learn anything, your mother has already said twice that you would have to go to Frankfurt to learn something, and I know her very well where the boys go to school there. Clara showed me the frightfully big house when we were out driving. There they don't merely uh, go when they're boys, but just the same when they get to be great big men. I saw that myself, and you mustn't suppose that there's only one teacher there as we have here, and such a kind one. Whole rows, ever so many together, are always going into the house, and all of them are dressed in black as if they were going to church and have such high black hats on their heads. And Heidi measured the size of the hats from the floor up, and the shivers ran down Peter's back. And then you would have to go in among all those, the masters, continued Heidi eagerly, and if it came your turn and you couldn't read it all and would make the mistakes even in the alphabet, and then you would see how the masters would laugh at you. That would be much worse than Tinetti and you ought to know how it is when she laughs at you. Then I will learn, said Peter, half fretfully, half whiningly. In a moment Heidi was calmed. Well, that is right, and we will begin at once, she cried with delight, and pulling Peter into a business-like way to the table, she brought out the articles needed for work. 
In Clara's big package there was a little book which had pleased Heidi very much, and it had occurred to her the night before that it would be a good thing to use for teaching Peter. It was an ABC book in rhyme. They both sat down at the table, their heads bent over the little book, and the lesson began. Peter had to spell the first sentences over and over again, for Heidi insisted on having it done nicely and without hesitation. Finally, she said, "'You don't know it yet, but I'll read it over and over to you, and if you know what it means, you can spell it out better.' And Heidi read, "'If A, B, C you do not know, before the school board you will go.' "'I will not go,' said Peter angrily. "'Where?' asked Heidi. "'Before the school board,' was the reply. <laughs> "'Then then try to learn the, the three letters, and you won't have to go,' explained Heidi. Then Peter began again, and repeated the three letters over and over until Heidi said, "'Now, you know these three. But as she noticed what an effort the words had made on Peter, and what an effect it had on him, she wanted to prepare a little for the following lessons. Wait, and I will read you the other sentences, she continued, then you will see all that is coming. And she began to read very clearly and distinctly. D E F G must smoothly fly, or else misfortune will be nigh. If H I J K are forgot, misfortune is on the spot. Who e'er on L M still will stumble must pay a fine and then feel humble. There's something bad if you uh, and if you knew you'd quickly learn N O P Q. If still on R S T you halt, the harm that comes will be your fault. Here Heidi stopped for Peter was as still as a mouse, and she had to see what he was doing. All these threats and mysterious horrors had so overcome him that he could not move a muscle, and was staring at Heidi in terror. This immediately touched Heidi's tender heart, and she said comfortingly, "'You mustn't be frightened, Peter. Just come to me every afternoon, and if you learn as well as you have today, you will know all the letters after a while, and then nothing will happen to you.' but you must come every day, and not the way you do in school. If it snows, it won't do you any harm. Peter promised to do so, for fear he had made him quite meek and obedient. Then he started home. Peter followed Heidi's orders strictly, and every afternoon studied the other letters eagerly, and learned the rhymes by heart. The grandfather often sat in the room and listened to the exercise while he smoked his pipe contentedly, and every little while the corners of his mouth twitched as if he could hardly keep from laughing. After the great struggle, Peter was usually invited to remain and take supper with them, and this at once richly rewarded him for the suffering that the day's verse had caused him. Thus the winter days passed away, and Peter came regularly and really made progress with his letters, but he had to wrestle every day with the verses. They had gone as far as you when Heidi read the couplet. If ever you mix U and V— You'll go where you'll not like to be, Peter growled. You, yes, see if I will. But he learned them thoroughly, as if he were under the impression that someone might take him secretly by the throat and carry him where he would not care to go. On the following afternoon, Heidi read, If now you fail to know the W, there hangs a stick and it will trouble you. And Peter looked around and said scornfully, there isn't any. Yes, there is. You don't know what Grandfather has in the chest. A stick as big around as my arm, and when he takes it out, he can say, Behold the stick, and it will trouble you. Peter knew the big hazel stick. He bent over his W at once and tried to grasp it. The next day the verse read, If you the letter X forget, for you no supper will be set. Then Peter looked inquiringly toward the cupboard, where the bread and cheese were kept, and said snappishly, I've never said that I should forget X. That is right. If you don't forget it, then we can learn one letter more, suggested Heidi, and tomorrow you will have only one left. Peter was not agreed, but Heidi read, If you on Y today delay, with scorn and shame you'll go away. Then there rose before Peter's eyes all the masters in Frankfurt, with their tall black hats on their heads and scorn and laughter in their faces. He immediately attacked the letter Y, and did not let it go again until he knew it so well that he could close his eyes and still see how it looked. 